top of the Excellent. Whoa. Happy New Year, folks. Happy New Year. Well, I'm Monty Mython, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, coming to you live from the Association of Anaesthetists Winter Scientific Meeting here in the centre of London at the QE2 Centre. That's the Queen Elizabeth II Centre. Now, for those of you who don't know that and listening from around the world, that's right in the heart of London. It's right opposite our Houses of Parliament. It's right opposite Big Ben. You can't see it at the moment because it's covered in scaffolding. Or if you know that big wheel thing by the river, it's just near that bit of it. But it's right down in in, uh, the centre of the whole action. Now, we're having a live dinner event yeah, those of you listened in to some of these before, generously sponsored by GE Healthcare. So a quick round of applause and thank you to GE Healthcare for sponsoring tonight. Thank you very much indeed. And obviously in front of a feisty audience. We've got three guests tonight. We're going to be covering a broad range of subjects. We're going to be taking questions from the floor here as we go along. The whole evening is in two sections, about 30 minutes with two guests now. We're going to have a short break then, get the kettle on at home. Uh, Then we're going to have a third guest join us. Then we're going to have a period of time to take questions from the floor and via Slido. So we're going to go straight into our first guest. That's uh, Matt, Dr. Matt Wiles. Would you, Matt, introduce yourself, please? Where are you from? What are you doing here? I know you are. Uh, Matt Wiles, I'm a neuroanesthetist and neurointensivist based in the frozen north of Sheffield. Um, And I'm here for the meeting, but also because I'm on the editorial board of the friendly white journal, Anesthesia. Anesthesia, the friendly journal. Very friendly. And you had an editorial board meeting today, did you? We did. Strategy, discussions, social media chat, Twitter. So it's it's great, great to carry on and come and, you know, uh, participate in a very 21st century exciting development. When will the paper journal stop? No one's listening to you. Okay, you can tell me. When the readership are happy, <laughs> apparently 81% still, still like a paper copy to come and land through their front door. But I, su- I suspect that will change with a new generation of people coming the through. The on. Uh, I, I, I don't think for long. I think five years and we'll be electronic only, would now be from, my guess. You're from Sheffield. One of my daughters is at uh, uh, Sheffield and she's having a fan. She absolutely loves it. And, and oh, that dragged me up there to visit for the first time. I, I kind of get it now. Um, that I think they have an uh, incredible statistic of something like 85% of graduates who leave the university come back yeah, and stay there. They just stay forever. Yeah, that's what, a great, what a great system. But who do you support in football? Middlesbrough. Where, where's that again? It, that is at the even more frozen northeast. So I was brought up in a land of chemicals, steelworks and pollution. A true, true lad of the north. So, um, Matt... <laughs> We, uh, lots of things we could talk about. Uh, I just want to ask you, I, I kind of teed you up a little bit this earlier, but we've been asking everyone about hot, top, hot topics for 2020. Now, so far, I'm not going to give you the whole list, but we've had things like, I'm not going to ask you if you believe in these or don't believe in them, but if they're on your list, you can pick them out. Prehabilitation, oxygen levels like oxygen toxicity, whether we're giving out too many opiates, artificial intelligence and closed loops. Do you think any of those would be on your list? We're not looking for the ones you don't like. Is any of them on your list? And do you have a need to add? Uh, I think hyperoxia, particularly no. particularly, um, particularly in neuronesis. We've seen the association with hyperoxia and worsening mortality in stroke. And whether that's correlation or causation, we don't know. Um, I think at a personal level, it's a drug. As anesthetists, we're very bad at titrating. We sort of try to individualize care a lot. But a lot of people just run all the patients on 50% for as long as it takes because that's easy. And not, don't necessarily think of it as a drug that will have benefits, but also possibly complications. Any of those other ones on your list? So oxygen's on the list, I'm taking. Any of the others? And if not, give us two others. Uh, I, I, I still do some um, preoperative assessments, so pre, prehabilitation, surgery schools, fitness for surgery. No doubt it's a benefit in terms of... Um, duration of stay patient centered outcomes patient experience is much better um what i'd add following on from conversations about um, e-journals would be sustainability in healthcare and the environmental impact of what we do as clinicians the choices we make the drugs we use um the nhs within the uk uses an awful lot of carbon our carbon footprint is huge yes and even in terms of education i mean perhaps what we're doing now and sharing thoughts throughout the world rather than flying over there may well become a model that becomes ever more common well we've flown i mean we fly around a lot to do this but what we're trying to do and we're trying to do it less and less is to allow a few people to get together so tens of thousands can stay at home or near home now we still need to socialize as well though don't we but you can still get together and listen in or watch in 
Well, we do. And so certainly even within Sheffield, we've periscoped conferences within a small group of people and had the same conversations and discussions, yeah. um, but without the travel and you know, without the cost to our employers, but also without the inconvenience because up and down to London in a day, particularly with our rail, uh, rail network, can be challenging. So environmental opportunities. I think one of my takeaways from last year, we were lucky. I know this is an area that you're very interested in, which is, uh, I think, depth of anesthesia. Um, we were lucky enough to be at the uh, uh, anesthesiology, the American, the big American meeting, just around the time that the balanced anesthesia trial mm-hmm. was released. So we got to interview Tim Short and Kate Leslie, hot off the press. And they sat down and they explained the results of this great big trial, this international effort looking at two different depths of anaesthesia and the sort of possible damp squib result you could argue was there was no difference between the two groups but I think it's a very very positive result it says deeper or lighter anaesthesia seem equally safe but the lighter anaesthesia guided by depth of anaesthesia used far fewer of the gases isn't that a big environmental opportunity certainly I mean and um, uh, locally Desflurane is getting absolutely roasted. And if right. you go into social media, you know, it's, its carbon equivalent footprint and how long it lasts in the environment is not, in, it's not insignificant. And the idea of doing anything that can help reduce an environmental agent, but also an agent that ultimately, we, you know, we sort of often forget this is a drug. We don't really fundamentally understand how it works. So the idea of giving less rather than more of what you need was seen to be sensible. So if we can segment that up, uh, if people want to listen to the podcast of the results, go into Top Med Talk, put in uh, Timothy Short or Balanced Anesthesia, for example, you can listen to their version of what their trial showed in the detail. The links to the papers are in the show notes. But what do, you've had a chance to, I think, look at it in detail. Your, your executive summary of what you thought it showed and what the takeaways were? Yeah, I thought it was a very positive study. Right. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, on the face of it, a negative study. And I think the authors in particular should be congratulated for how they wrote it up and how the journal handled it. They didn't try to make it what it wasn't. And wearing my editorial hat, that's something we see a lot. Just because you don't hit your primary outcome measure doesn't mean there's not value in there. 73 countries, over nearly 7,000 patients. And Gary Mills, who worked in Sheffield, um, was also one of the authorship group. And as a result, we recruited quite a lot. So I know I contributed four patients myself. Um... Uh, to this study. And a whole year. Yeah. I'd, uh, it'd be because, like, because... Back off state. Calm down, buddy. Not four patients in a whole... I'm only joking. Go <laughs> four, on. Four <laughs> patients out of 6,000. You know, I, I'm amazed I wasn't one of the named authors. It seems so unfair. Um, a, a, a very interesting population. Yeah. You know, patients we worry about for all the things you've mentioned, prehabilitation and stuff, aged over 60, ASA 3 or 4, having major surgery. And what a really good primary outcome measure they took. One year mortality. Yes. You know, a long-term patient-centered, you know, if I'm going to go through this surgery, what are my chances of having a really important outcome uh, at one year? Um, and there was no difference. You know, one year mortality, roughly 7% in both groups. So deeper anesthesia doesn't appear to be harmful long-term. And lighter anesthesia, carefully titrated with the monitors, was equally as safe. Is that right? And one of the one of the positives takeaway was the awareness rate. Yes, one patient um, in the population, even though around forty percent of the patients were run at an end tidal level of less than 0.7 of a mac. Right. So that was very reassuring for the use of depth of anaesthesia as a guide, but also reassures people that actually you can run a range of yes. end tidal concentrations without concerns. And I think uniquely to that paper, they looked at age-adjusted mm. um, max and also adjusted for the use of nitrous and other things, which many of the earlier works that suggested the benefit, Dan Slesser's work with the triple low, hadn't accounted for that. And when you look at around that 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 of a mac, there's actually a linear relationship for age if you look at the, um, uh, the mac age-adjusted equivalent charts. So actually, it can make quite important differences. So from that point of view, it was really reassuring. I have, I speaking to someone who actually put patients through it, wow, it was difficult to keep patients to that tight level of control. And that's where the study fell down. So ultimately, it was underpowered for all the outcomes. Mortality was slightly better than they expected. Um, but also, uh, you, it was very hard to maintain patients within five absolute BIS units. And I certainly struggled. I mean, I, I use predominantly TIVA for my neuro. I'm happy. I'm confident. I believe the number that BIS has. 
but the lowest I had a patient running uh, on that to maintain the BIS of 50 with an epidural in for a major hip revision. They had an end tidal sevo of 0.3. No. Which, unless you were fully convinced that this worked, but then... Were you nervous? Um, <laughs> slight, a bigger problem then is if a patient moves a bit or the surgeon moves it, you haven't got any dampening of any other adrenergic response. Mm. So then you get a big spicing bit, huge spicing blood pressure, and it becomes a really difficult anaesthetic to manage. So I understand why they lost a huge number of patients. You know, almost 3,000 patients were lost due to overlap between the groups. So this, we'll come back to this later on, and this has been a recurring theme. On our list of hot t- tops tips for 2020 is closed or open loop systems so in other words if you let your depth of anesthesia monitor talk to your anesthesia vaporizer with a computer assist in between you'd still be in charge you'd be in control of the joystick you'd be flying the plane if you sort of mean but they'd be able to keep it there the computer would keep it there much better than you could keep it there do you accept that not with this okay um it's that polarizes a lot of people particularly in the uk Yep. people with you know is it a random number generator yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or is it a really useful tool it is a monitor right it is prone to all the weaknesses and deficiencies of any of the monitor we use pulse oximetry ecg non-invasive blood pressures we all know in certain situations they are less reliable or sometimes hopeless it doesn't stop us using them but it's the ability to yeah, process but aren't it you using it and you adjusting the vapor to try and keep it in a particular range uh, i was um but this is a number that is generated via an uncertain algorithm which is one of the reasons people don't like the black box because we don't really know where the number's right. coming from. But also it's a 45 to 55 second average bit. Right. So it tells me how things were. Similar to saturation. Can't, can't you program, program that into the computer though? To, and because of the process... Well, you seem to be suggesting you're better at this than a computer would be. I'm suggesting in terms of... I'm not, I don't doubt you are, but everyone's not as good as you. Uh, I think in terms of the ability to look at the whole picture, it's okay. like, any, like any number you get, yeah, well, that heart rate, that saturation, actually you need to look at the whole patient and contextualise it. And what I've, certainly, what I've certainly seen with this is there are a number of unique procedures or stimulus that cause abnormalities. EMG being a major factor, and we see this on critical care a lot, but also things uh, when it detects a frequency from direct pressure. Surgeons are often clumsy with their hands. They don't tend to worry about pressing on patients, particularly their head bits. But frequency of drills. So I do a lot of pituitary surgery. The frequency of the drill that vibrates up the nose confuses the bis, and but, it thinks it's EMG, and it with pushes up my number. Fly-by-wire, which is what I've been learning about over Christmas. I had enough time to listen to a, the, you know, the original Apollo missions and got my head around the difference between closed loops and open loops and fly-by-wire. You're still flying the plane if you let the computers help. It's just you said at the beginning it was really, really hard to keep your your trim, if you see what I mean. Um, Don't you think the computer could help in that little space there just to help your joystick adjustment? Um, with Tiva... It sounds like I'm really plugging something that we're going to be, someone's going to be selling next year. This is all pie in the sky, by the way. I think there's some research work in this space. But uh, I think with Tiva you can. Yeah. I think, you know, with, with a Tiva and a Sedic, you tell me to aim for a number... And I, I will hit that relative, relatively accurately within, very, uh, within a, 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 a very small degree of variance. With volatile, which was the point yes. of a balance yeah. study, okay, right. at low flows, I've either got to, you know, we, we, can wa- we can wave the environmental flag again and say, I either yeah. have it at very high flows, yeah, but it may yeah, give a very yeah, expensive yeah. anesthetic, but it lets me adjust the end tidal very, very rapidly. Gotcha. I don't think a computer can do that unless it can adjust the flows. I think you'd end up using a lot of volatile anesthetic. Teva in steady state, once you hit that sweet spot, the variation um, is, is actually very small. So, yeah, I would, I, would, I would make my neuro days a lot easier if I just had a computer. It was just taking things up and down gently and running with it. Volatile, I think it's going to challenge. Gotcha. So it's the choice of agent that made it harder, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll come to some Slido questions in a second. We'll bring our next guest up in a moment. But before we do that, is there anything else you want us to take away from the balanced study? I know there's a whole load of stuff in there. Balanced anesthesia study, I should say. Um, I think it sort of raised the flag again about people, people who don't see the value yes. in depth of anesthesia monitoring will use this as something else to say there is no benefit. Um, Why would, would they see it that way, around? Because you can give a lot more gas and drug than you need and the outcomes are okay. I, I was taken by the fact I can give as little as possible and that's a good thing, isn't it? Um, people would say that if major outcomes, complications and mortality were the same, if you're looking at, um, if you're looking at uh, uh, an extra cost of maybe about £10 a patient, they would, they would argue that the, there's, a, there's a cost effect to that without 
influ uh, influencing duration of stay or critical care admission um, or bid things. Part of it comes down to the problems with doing any studies with this and also the misnomer. It's not a depth of anesthesia. Okay. They're not depth of anesthesia monitor. They are processed EEG monitors that produce a number that predicts probability of recall. So gotcha. the big thing to take away from that is, do you know what? It predicted probability of recall really well in that the awareness rate was far lower than you'd expect from other population studies, one in 7,000. It does what it's supposed to do. We've taken that number and then imagined that it falls into some sort of linear response and that reflects a depth of anesthesia and a bit of 60 is a much lighter anesthetic than a bit of 30. We don't actually know that. And if there was, if there was a really big difference at that sort of level of anesthesia, we would see that in other areas. Why isn't regional anesthesia so much better for complications than avoiding yes, all yes. these agents? And yet we've looked at that in multiple areas, yeah. neck of femur, carotid and arterectomies. We haven't been able to show that regional anesthesia per se, so avoiding all these potentially toxic agents and not affecting the brain or in any way is any better. So I think the idea of just taking this single isolated process EEG effect and saying that's a target yeah. is, probably, is, 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 is probably a mistake and... And it's, we're trying to extrapolate uh, the process of EG to do something it was never designed to do. So I'm going to call up our next guest. And while, that, while Marcus settles in, I'm just going to take a few quick fire questions. How is, from Slider, how is depth of anesthesia monitoring changing? Um, if I were to make one prediction for the next 10 years, um, I would say that volatile anesthesia is going to disappear in the developed world. Oh, wow. There we go. There you go. That's, <laughs> that, that's my prediction for two reasons. I think the major driver will be environmental effects because TIVA is ultimately cleaner from an environmental point of view. And I think if the work on uh, oncological outcomes yes. that came from uh, Tim Wigmore at the Marsden, if those prospective RCTs do come to pass and there is any signal at all that there's a difference in terms of tumour recurrence, that will be the death knell for... Um, uh, for volatile anesthesia and on the back of that we're gonna i think very quickly we could have a whole generation of anesthetists who may have not used tiva since they were trainees of suddenly almost being nudged very strongly in that direction and certainly i've got surgical colleagues who are now requesting onco anesthesia oh there we go and i say what is that you An know anti-onco <laughs> um and i think on on the basis of that um I think the only way to get people through that learning curve will be with some reassurance of uh, with depth of anesthesia uh, with depth of anesthesia monitoring. So I, I expect it to become as commonplace as seeing your trainer force stimulator or your pulse oximeter. So, up down answer, and then we'll move on. Awareness during anesthesia increasing or decreasing? Do you think? Uh, decreasing. Excellent. Oh, I hope that's true. Marcus, who are you? What are you doing here? Hi, I'm uh, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you again, Marcus. Yeah, really by the nice way, welcome. To see you too. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm an intensive care consultant and anaesthetist at Fremley Park, and I'm the co-chair of the FUSIC committee, the Intensive Care Society's focused ultrasound for intensive care. And we, uh, along with very many fantastic colleagues, help set up some ultrasound training for the UK. Excellent. So you're an ultrasound. What do you make about what you've just been hearing? We'll come back to a bit more about you. It's fascinating. It resonated for me because uh, I, I use BIS uh, for my TIVA anaesthetics and I do a lot of colorectal um, stuff for cancer. And I, I, I think it's great. Really helps me to, um, to do my job. Did you, uh, have you heard much about the balanced anaesthesia study, either reading it directly or chatter in bars have, or whatever? I haven't actually. Oh, I'm well, sorry to say I haven't. No, no. But, uh, the, uh, what do you, there's one argument that there's not a whole load to hear. There's yeah. another argument there's a huge amount to take yeah. away from. I'm sure you will hear quite yeah. a lot about yeah. it. There'll be quite yeah. a lot of discussion. Yeah. Do, you, do you think it's going to go the way that Ma that uh, is predicted by Matt? Yes, I do. I do. I think it's um, it's popular. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do. You're very, you're very, very compelling argument. Um, Hot Topics 2020. We gave you prehab, the oxygen, the opiates, the AI, and closed and open loops. What, do you want to pick any of those? Do you want to add any to that? AI, for sure. Okay. Which, particularly in the world I, I work in, I think it's going to be a big, big thing in the next uh, year and the next 10 years. I'd also add, because I work in a district general, not like you in a tertiary centre, that a big thing for us this year is going to be decentralisation of paediatric intensive care. That's going to be okay. a big uh, it's going to be a big subject for us. Uh, is that is that happening at scale and pace? It's not, but the uh, the the papers have come out. The the, uh, the committee, um, the Pediatric Intensive Care Society, have um, released uh, their wishes for us to retrieve quite a lot of patients back into adult services. That because right. they just can't cope with the the flow, particularly high high 
appears in demand. Because when I was a, a young doctor, mm. a long time ago now, mm. uh, you took people into intensive care irrespective of their size and age. Yeah. And then they sort of said, well, the very, very small ones, the ones that seem to behave quite differently, yeah. maybe under two, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. you ought to send to some more specialist centres. Yeah. But once they get to a sort of eight, nine, ten, mm. we foolishly thought they were like small, big people. Yeah. And we would just look after them. Yeah. And then we were told we shouldn't do that. You're yeah. saying it's swinging back. They are, I think, you know, small adults. I think we can do that. But I think in my lifetime, it's all been done in paediatric uh, intensive care centres. So our job is to stabilise and then they come and retrieve and take them away. And I've worked in those centres before I became a consultant where I work at the moment. Yep. And I appreciate both sides of that argument. Uh, for, for instance, children who have uh, seizures, uh, you know, most of them yeah, that get retrieved are woken up immediately at the other end. And, um, you know, I think uh, patients and children, families want to stay nearer to their homes and uh, I think that's um, and, and there is a strict logistical problem at the moment particularly in the winter periods for uh, for accommodating them in pit, in pit use so many of us are encouraged to expect them on location back at the hospitals we're in and I think we're going to see a big trend towards particularly level two management in in the okay. region interesting and mm. they also there we get on to discussions about transfers later on I yeah. presume as part of that once you sort of push things out and do as much as you can you're going to increase the need for specialist referral when it doesn't quite go according to plan absolutely but you're going to do it really well because you're planning for it yeah and absolutely there's going to be level two units within regions so they're not going to be in the picky necessarily they're going to be in a in a district general maybe and there's the whole complexity of moving sick level two children uh, amongst the region and that that's a, a problem i haven't quite um fully solved yet well in london we do we we have had for quite a long time a highly specialist you know retrieval to, to center mm. for pediatrics but it's probably going to need to increase in its numbers and everyone's going to need to engage in, yeah. in the opportunity yeah. Now, do you know that's happening, or is that your prediction for 2020? Prediction? I know that is happening. That's, oh, that's, that's the will. Good, yes, that's no, a strong yeah, prediction. Yeah, yeah. That's the will. <laughs> I don't want to look on Paddy Power early. They won't give you nods on it, so you know. <laughs> Have you well, got a prediction we don't know will happen, um, not necessarily? What, what's, what's your sort of guess? Well, Anything I... Anything hot, do you think? Uh, I've also, I mean, Where do you I'll, stand on prehab? Do you think that's hot? Prehab, or? yes, I do, yeah. I've, okay. met, I've met people who are very passionate about that. It's not something I know about very much at the no, moment, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other sexy topics? What do you think? Well, we've given you the prehab. You've yeah. taken the AI and the closed loops and you've given oh. us paediatric intensive care. So you maybe got the three. Well, I mean, stuff I know from ultrasounds happening. Is that is that something I can bring in? Or is we've that, got, is we that brought you up here specifically to discuss well, ultrasounds. <laughs> so luckily, because we spoke yeah. to you just over yes. a year ago here. Yes, yeah. Where yeah you yeah. were walking past. You it said hello. I came to say chat. hi and you put the cans on. And, yeah. was, <laughs> <laughs> and we recorded a fantastic interview oh, with great. Desiree Chapel. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you told fantastic. us all about ultrasound and we went away believing it. <laughs> so I think your stance is... There is a huge things happening and I, I think for me the one the summary is that everybody's coming together there's never been a stronger time where cardiology anesthesia uh, medicine are coming together uh, for the benefit of patients around ultrasound so there, there, there's huge collaboration going on behind the scenes and that will be the defining moment for us in 2020 okay so let's go back through this so this is use of ultrasound technology mm -hmm. at the bedside mm -hmm. which is now much more readily available yeah and you can seems like you can put it almost anywhere. Yep. Inside and without the law, you can. There are multiple different places you can put the yep. the probe. Yeah. And it seems now as though the very young doctors are learning to do ultrasound. Is it gone back into medical school yet? I, I know it's. Wish. I know the sort of people around that sort of year one, year two are going on courses now. I wish it was. But it's I not really, quite there, is it? No, and it's you know it's taking them time to catch up. But it is in the states. There are some centres that do this routinely, but I think we're not quite there yet. I wish we were, because I think it's much more effective than clinical examination with a stethoscope. We should never remove the stethoscope, but in terms of uh, the things that matter to me in the ICU, you can pick them up with ultrasound very, very readily. Okay, Did, no one's listening. Do you still actually use a stethoscope? Mine is hanging in my locker. It's got dust on it. Right. So you said we shouldn't get rid of the stethoscope. That was just a platitude, wasn't it? You asked me off record, right? Yeah. yeah this no isn't going out worldwide, right? No. Okay. But, but, but you're saying you can yeah. do it all with I work in a team with auscultation in the team members. Okay. But I, yeah. Your but, team uh, auscultator. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, ultrasound brings you a huge amount. There's much of, uh, much of what we're looking for that you just can't detect clinically. You know, 
Like, do you want me to list a few things? Yeah, we'll do in a second. But I'm uh, coming towards the end of my mm. clinical career, possibly mm. in intensive care. Yeah. Should I be allowed back in to do another shift if I can't do ultrasound? <laughs> I mean, that you, sort you're, of you're, happened you're, in cardiac. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of happened in cardiac. It got to a stage with transesophageal echocardiography yeah, yeah. where you had to either join yeah. in or get out. I would say your clinical skills are very good, Monty, and I think <laughs> using your... <laughs> you haven't worked with me for a long time. But. <laughs> that, uh, you know, the thing is, chest x-ray, auscultation, all these things have... Should I put it low. if I stay for another mm. few years in ITU? Should mm. I put it on my list of skills to acquire and take my... What are you looking seriously? for? What, what, what are you I worried about? I want to do about? the best possible job I can Cause, do. Because I think you'll be a very good clinician, but you'll be average next to someone with ultrasound. Because Ooh, people with ultrasound will pick up things that you haven't picked up now you got my attention give me some examples give me a working so, example okay so uh the earlier you get the more your physiology changes mm -hmm. in, in ways that uh, make it much much less likely the signs are going to be s s sensitive and specific example uh somebody comes in with a long history of breathlessness ankle swelling crackles at the lung bases in the outpatient setting they've probably got heart failure but mm. once you get critical illness you just can't tell and we know that because sensitivity specificity and predictive value for these things are very very low for instance looking for low ejection fraction or you know, yeah. left ventricular impairment there are signs you can look at that might pick up chronic heart failure but acute heart failure they're very very few and actually there's very few signs that can rule it out in fact if you don't do a valsalva maneuver which is um something we don't do very much um the the evidence stands for valsalva but other than that there are no signs that can pick out low ejection fraction so you so we rely on our kind of clinical patterns and our gestals but um the patient i just mentioned ankle edema crackles etc you know so many times i've looked with ultrasound and my colleagues will back this up that you look and think i'm expecting to see heart failure and i see a heart that's underfilled with, yes you know small vessels small heart this person needs volume and I think that's the big win. And there are many others. But you have to, uh, I'm presuming like everything else we do, you put it in the big picture. Yeah. You don't become obsessed oh, with the course. ultrasound. Oh, of course. No, no, no. You have to, it's history, all about. History, examination, put yeah. it in context. So, so I, I really think history is the biggest win, I think. But most of our patients can't give big histories. They, you know, some of them can't speak at all. You meet them shocked, they're semi-conscious, and you don't have that. So, you know, you've got ancillary tests, which we know aren't perfect. You know, chest x-rays aren't very sensitive. Lung ultrasound is much more effective for picking up the important wins. So a compelling, passionate argument. Yeah. Okay, two quick things. We'll come back to it, yeah, two quick yeah. things. Where's the evidence, and do we need it? So the evidence is uh, it can be done. The evidence is that sensitivity and specificity are, are, are good for picking up uh, a lot of what we're looking for. Um, the, there's a, evidence to show consistently the impact is around 50%. So, you know, doing ultrasound is going to change what you were thinking or doing. So those, I think those are beyond doubt. The, the outcome data is limited. Uh, there are some single centre studies. Does that matter? Well, I, I, I don't think you're ever going to get a randomised control trial in, in, in this area that's going to prove it. I, I, and I don't think it matters. And partly because, uh, you know, it's hard to get equipoise because if you're good enough to, to, to deliver it, you probably believe it's a good thing. I think um, trying to, you know, need, need huge studies to make that um, kind of show benefit. And, and also interoperative, uh, interoperative variability is an issue. So, you know, who, you know is it, do you trust EM doctors? Do you trust intensive care doctors? You know, and I, and I think it's such a complex study to, to do. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to happen. And I think we just look to transesophageal echo and tell me how many randomized controlled trials, you know, were there before we implemented that as a routine uh, part of perioptive care for cardiac patients. Oh, we're so, lucky enough to have one of the people in the I audience know, who started the Sol. whole journey. But we'll bring him in after Such the break. We'll, bring, we'll yeah. bring in Dr. Yeah. Sol Aronson, one of our uh, US anchors for Top Med Talk <laughs> and a legend in this field, legend. is here to put us straight after the break. Before we take a short break and bring in our third guest, very briefly, what are the recent developments in ICU ultrasound to monitor cardiac output using ultrasound is one of our Slido questions. Well, you know, that is an area I'm really interested in. I think so to date, we've had a situation where there's very basic ultrasound, which are vice and feel and focus and is, is, the, is the area and then there's advanced ultrasound which is a kind of master's level two plus year endeavor to kind of get a board certification and there should be nothing in the middle and i think you know personally there are it's a continuum of le 
learning and with people who do focus basic echo need to develop and i think there is some ground just in the middle and cardiac output is definitely one of them it won't replace continuous monitoring because echo is a contiguous tool it's not something we would do continuously but in environments like the emergency department or in the unit when you just brought them in looking for uh, signs of low stroke volume is is an easy win with echo um definitely i mean mean, i've seen some incredible pictures of some of the stuff that's coming over the horizon like Mm. 3d echo and is that that's all happening is it Mm. so 3d echo is uh, still a research tool and uh and it's difficult still any good 2d windows get good 3d um so i'm I'm not sure i think strain and stuff is coming on the horizon for sure um and i think for us uh in we're looking at um, developing focus toe Right. as something that is something on the near horizon which is going to be exciting or T-E-E for those T-E-E listening E-E in E-E the rest E-E of the world yeah. and that transesophageal <laughs> echo spelt the right way or the wrong way is that right yeah. you can choose which one's right and which one's wrong we, we, you know uh, so small um, training systems are picked up around the world and I think that's right it's, it's a good thing for us to do in certain patients excellent well thank you both for teeing us up for the conversation after the break we're going to take a short break now thank you for listening thanks Marty <laughs> Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. The time has arrived for you to get yourself your ticket to Ebpom Dingle. That's right, one of the most famous conferences in the perioptive sphere is going ahead. We've taken Ebpom Dingle virtual. The 22nd Current Controversies in Anesthesia and Perioptive Medicine and SIAA Autumn Congress will go ahead virtually. Live from Dingle Island you can attend this incredible conference. Spoken of frequently here on Top Med Talk in hallowed terms, it is, of course, a place that is known to produce results. Ebpom Dingle. Check out ebpom.org and get yourself online for the conference of the year, Ebpom Dingle 2020.